Good morning. Welcome to this morning's gardening class. We'll go ahead and get started in a few seconds. We're going to give folks just um, a little bit of time to, to get logged on and, and join us this morning. Morning. If you're just joining us, we're going to get started in. I'll give it 15, 15 seconds. Our numbers are climbing. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to this morning's class, sprucing up your landscape and protecting it. Um, today's class is virtual. It will be posted on our website um, within a week. So if you go to our YouTube page or on our on our regular website, you can find it under the landscape and gardening um, workshop tab. Um, just some housekeeping for, for Zoom. We, the class will be about 45 minutes with about 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. Um, you're more than welcome to enter questions. They will be answered at the very end. Um, please enter them into the Q&A um, box. And if you want to directly message me or John, you can do so using the chat um, feature. A little bit about SCV Water. Uh, we're a full service regional water provider for the whole Santa Clara Valley. Um, we were formed in 2018 by an act of state legislator. Um, we also provide service to nearly 300,000 people in the Santa Clara Valley. Um, we also have some pretty cool landscape resources. This is brand new, our Garden Smarter um, publication. It is available on our website, and I will actually drop a link to that in our um, in our chat. So once I'm done talking, I'll drop that, that link in there for you. It's awesome. I highly recommend it. And you can also request um, a print copy of it. And these are some other resources that we have. They're all available on our website. Um, one that you might want to use is the top SCV the top 100 SCV friendly plant guide um, that has 50 native um, SCV plants and 50 non-native. So, but they all will thrive um, in, in our valley. One thing if you haven't done yet, I highly recommend doing the Water Smart Workshop. You can get a $20 credit on your water bill. Um, and it's just, it's a guided process on in learning how to identify and fix leaks, um, as well as identifying other um, home water issues. Um, I'm briefly going to talk about the smart irrigation controller rebate. You can get up to $150 and you can use your smartphone phone to manage and irrigate from anywhere. Um, and also tells you if it's rained, you it won't water for at least 48 hours. Um, so that's pretty cool. It helps you save water and money. And then the pool cover rebate, this one's awesome for the summer. Um, you can get a rebate of up to $200 um, and it helps prevent evaporation from your pool. So that was it for me. I'm gonna go ahead and let John take it over. He is our instructor for today. Morning folks, and uh, welcome to our first uh, summer class. Uh, I know it hasn't seemed like summer recently. Uh, normally by this time of year, we're, we're cooking and, and dreading the uh, the summer, uh, but we haven't really had any hot weather to speak of yet this year, but we know it's coming and we're probably not gonna like it when it does. But uh, in the meantime, enjoy these uh, rather nice days that we've been getting. But with the summer and hot weather on the horizon, there's a few things we're gonna talk about. And uh, perhaps the uh, most important thing is going to be watering. And during these last six months or so, we haven't had to water very much. We had large amounts of rain in January, February, in March, and everything was still wet up through April. Uh, so most of us probably didn't start watering until May. And then we had overcast weather throughout most of May and June. But now we're into July and we have to consider uh, summer watering. So uh, as this is our first uh, summer class, uh, we're going to try to help you out and, and uh, teach you how to 
how for you to survive and how for your plants to survive the heat that we know is coming. So uh, the name of our class is sprucing up and uh, protecting your landscaping. And uh, so we'll give you some tips. Uh, and as I mentioned, the most important thing is probably going to be watering. So we'll probably start right on that. And Don, did you yes. want to share your screen? Oh, yes, of course. Yeah, it might help if they can see the presentation. Yes, yes. Let me yeah. see what happened here. I did have it a minute ago. Um, let me see where it went here. Okay, there's that one. You're now, gonna want to hit share screen on um, on Zoom. And there we go. Is that better? And up. all right. Yeah, if you can just make it um full screen, that'll be awesome. All right, thank you. Okay. Okay, so a uh, couple of things you can do, of course, is uh, just go out and check the irrigation. Uh, if you have a, a lawn, you can go put uh, cups, just clear drinking cups uh, throughout the lawn. And then turn the sprinklers on. I usually suggest for this test, uh, turn the sprinklers on for about 10 minutes then go out and look in the cups. What we're hoping to get is about three eighths of an inch in each cup. When you do this test, you may find that some areas of the lawn are getting the three eighths of an inch and they probably look pretty good. If you're not getting three eighths of an inch throughout the whole lawn, you may get some dry spots, but that's just a matter of adjusting the sprinklers at that point. And maybe a different uh, nozzle on the sprinkler or something. So that, but that's a real easy test to do. There's something else you can do that's also very simple is take a screwdriver and go out to the lawn and stick the screwdriver in a nice green lush spot and just feel the resistance as you're poking the screwdriver. Then go over to a dry or brown spot or a spot that doesn't look as great and stick the screwdriver in there. This simple test will tell you a couple of things. It will tell you if the soil has gotten hard in the dry area. And if so, it could be because the sprinklers aren't hitting that area very well. Could also mean you've got some hard pan soil in there. So if that means that you have to reseed or put a new piece of sod in, Make sure you dig that soil up real well and perhaps add some soil amendments in there uh, before continuing. And then with the little cup test, if you find that a bad area actually has more water than a good area, then you've probably got fungus. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Okay. Uh, now, the other thing to check when you look at your irrigation is make sure that a plant hasn't grown up and blocked uh, your sprinklers. Uh, this happens uh, quite often, quite often uh, in the turf, for instance, a pop-up sprinkler won't pop up quite as high as it needs to, to get to the next head because sprinklers are designed to have head-to-head -head coverage. They don't water the area underneath them. Also in your shrubs, if a, shrub is blocking your sprinkler, the water won't get as far perhaps as you uh, want it to do. So this is our mantra, water deeply but infrequently. So it's better to water for a longer period of time less often than it is to water for short periods of time frequently. And uh, if you have heavy soils and you tend to get runoff, uh, then cycling the water means run it for however many minutes you can without getting runoff. Then turn it off 
for 30 minutes and do it again. In other words, you're still trying to put as much water on in a shorter period of time, but you don't want runoff. So with a heavy clay soil, you may have to water, then stop for a little bit and then apply water again. Doing this will get the roots to go down deeper and the deeper and bigger the root system, uh, the more soil uh, it can fill in and the more moisture it can uh, find. Uh, shallow rooted plants simply don't have much of a chance when it gets real hot. And uh, if you have noticed that you have to water very frequently because your plants are wilting, then it's because the roots have not gone down as far as they can. And uh, once again, the deep watering will help to encourage deeper rooting. Now, the optimal watering period is early morning, not at night. At night can cause diseases. Um, I mentioned that if you have a lot of water in one area of the lawn, uh, the lawn can actually get fungus and die. The lawn, the, the people that uh, grow sod and that manufacture sod and seed, they suggest the best time to water your grass, your lawn, is between 6 and 8 a.m. Um, for your drip irrigation on some of your shrubs and other things, you can water a little earlier than that. Uh, but we don't want you to water in the late afternoon or evening. Also, sometimes watering during daylight hours, like any time after 10 a.m., uh, you can lose a lot more water to evaporation. So just remember, early morning hours, between 6 and 8 for your lawn, uh, between maybe four and six uh, for your shrubs and trees. Uh, one thing you can do is, you know, this year with all of the rain, I think we've all encountered more weeds than we ever have in our lives. The, uh, the weeds have just done quite well, quite well. And uh, the there's a couple problems with weeds. The one is they compete for the sunlight. So they do compete with our good plants. They take the water and they take the food. Um, so the removal of weeds is actually very important. It not only makes the yard look better, but uh, you remove some of that competition uh, from the good plants. And uh, you can uh, use different types of sprays to do that, there are lots of natural sprays on the market now. Some that will remove weeds in the lawn without hurting the lawn, and some that will kill the weeds growing elsewhere. Uh, check your trees. You good time to remove any dead or broken branches, or if there's parts of your tree, limbs of your tree that are hanging over other areas and shading them you might wanna cut those back to get the sunlight into your plants. If you absolutely have to feed in the summer, make it very light applications. Um, liquids, there's less chance of burning with liquid fertilizers, less chance of burning with the uh, natural fertilizers and uh, any fertilizers at all, just use them lightly in the summer. Uh, even the uh, sod, manufacturers suggest going lighter on the feeding during the next few months, uh, July, August, and September. After you've pulled the weeds, make sure to apply a pre-emergent. Uh, this will prevent the seeds of those weeds from sprouting. And there are pre-emergents you can put on your lawn, pre-emergents you can put in your flower beds, and they work to prevent the seeds of weeds from sprouting. Uh, I know I've been out pulling weeds and I'll come out two weeks later and there's more weeds there. And it's because of the seeds of the weeds that I've already pulled. They simply sprouted again. So 
When it comes to controlling weeds, there are what we call post-emergent. These kill the weeds that we see. Then there are pre-emergent. These prevent the seeds from germinating. And uh, uh, you know what they say about an ounce of prevention that's worth a pound of cure. So uh, use preventatives, especially if you've been out there weeding and it's all nice and clean now. You should go out immediately and apply a preventer. Now, I do have to tell you, there's fewer and fewer preventers on the market each year. One that's still available out there is called Preen, P-R-E-E-N, and that's a pretty good one. There are some others that contain corn gluten, and they have a very limited range. The list of weeds they prevent will be much smaller than say preen or any other uh, preventer, but the corn gluten is natural. Good time to check uh, for your mulch. Um, if your mulch has decomposed over the years, you may want to add some more. If you don't have any, this is a good time to add it. It does a lot of wonderful things for the soil. It moderates the temperature. It'll actually keep the soil cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. Uh, so mulch is wonderful stuff. I do have to warn you, do not put mulch up against the trunks of trees or the base of plants. From a small plant, keep the mulch at least six inches away. From a large tree, keep it about 18 inches away. Mulch up against the trunks, of trees and shrubs uh, can be actually harmful to the plants. So uh, the best mulches to use are woody mulches that are very coarse in texture. Um, you can cover your drip system. Um, you, you can put it everywhere. It does help to prevent weeds. There's also weed block fabric you can put down and then Put this wood mulch on top of the weed block fabric. It, uh, the weed block fabric itself lasts for years and years and years, and then you just simply replace the mulch as need be. Now you can get mulch in bags. For small areas, you can just stop by the nursery and pick up mulch in bags. It's uh, fairly economic, and uh, it's usually very attractive looking material that you would buy in a bag. Tree trimmers uh, will also quite often give you the mulch or the wood chippings uh, straight off their truck. If you see a tree trimmer in your neighborhood, you might ask them if you could have some of those wood chips. Uh, I have done that and uh, gotten truckloads from them. You can also go pick some up at several different locations uh, throughout the uh, LA area. The closest one to us is Lopez Canyon over in Lakeview Terrace. And uh, you can uh, go there, pick it up yourself, or you can also call them and they will deliver it to your site. Uh, there's typically a charge for the delivery, but if you have a means of picking it up yourself, uh, it's absolutely free. Now, we're going to talk about turf again for a minute. Since turf uses more water than anything else in the landscaping, and uh, turf needs to be watered more frequently than plants or trees. So, it's good to know what kind of grass you have. Some types of grass are more drought tolerant than others. Uh, some types of grass wouldn't necessarily be preferred out here. Things like bluegrass uh, tend to burn up when it gets hot. They're not as drought tolerant as say the uh, tall fescues. And uh, certainly, you don't want the grass to grow up to the base of trees or shrubs. Probably the worst thing you can do is plant a tree in the middle of your lawn. If you absolutely have to have a tree, 
in your lawn, you should cut the lawn out, maybe a nice three foot circle, maybe a little bigger, mound the area and then plant the tree at the top of the mound. Having this mound will help to evaporate the excess soil because trees do not want as much water as the lawn. So if you already have a lawn in the middle of the tree and it's not doing well, there may be no option other than to remove the tree, rework the area, mound it up, and then plant another tree. So, yes, what did we what happened? Okay. So there are cool season grasses. These would be things like fescues, bluegrass, and rye grasses. Then there's warm season grasses, which are grasses that turn brown, they go dormant. In the winter, these would be things like Bermuda and St. Augustine. And so there are advantages to the ones that go dormant. They obviously don't need to be watered as much uh, in the winter because they're dormant. The cool season grasses need to be watered all year uh, until the rains come. So know what type of grass you have, and uh, that'll help you to determine how frequently you need to water. So the cool season grasses, uh, the tall fescues are the most common. I think marathon grass is probably the most popular grass that we have here in Santa Clarita. It is a tall fescue. And with deep watering, its roots can go quite deep. And it is the deep roots that allow the grass to go longer periods of time in between waterings. Now, other types of grass like uh, rye, blue, and bent grass, they don't have nearly as deep a root system. The warm season grasses like Bermuda and St. Augustine, um, they have roots that go down, but then also they have shoots that go uh, sideways. So these warm season grasses tend to spread. So it's best if they are enclosed via cement or asphalt, some impermeable barrier to prevent the grass from growing into areas that you don't want it to grow to. So a couple things you can do with your lawn. One is grow it as tall as possible. Keep it three and a half inches or higher. So that means after you mow it, you want it to be three and a half inches tall. Um, if, if that means you don't mow as often, uh, that's fine. Uh, if you have to feed, use slow release organic uh, fertilizers with low nitrogen. That means the first number on the bag would be less than 10. Most of the organics are at about five. That's 5% 5 nitrogen. And uh, that small amount of nitrogen will work quite well uh, during the warm months. During the winter months, of course, you, you that number can be quite high, uh, 20, 25%. But it's a little dangerous to use fertilizers with numbers that high during the warm months. So this slide simply shows you what happens if you cut the grass too short. If you cut the grass too short, the roots won't go as deep. Allow the grass to grow tall, as we mentioned, and the roots will go deeper. And, and this tall grass uh, does help to prevent evaporation by shading the uh, soil. Uh, sharpen your moral blades. Now, if you've got a gardener, you can ask him to sharpen his blades a little more frequently, and perhaps he will. If you have your own mower, uh, you should be doing this uh, yourself. Uh, uh, just once a year, really fine, at the start of each season. Uh, just 
sharpen your lawnmower blades and it'll cut it a lot neater and won't give you that uh, burnt look on the top. Now, as we mentioned, fertilizing in the summer can be a little tricky. It's typically avoided if at all possible. How do we know if we need it? Well, the color will be off on the plants. Um, they won't grow. Uh, they might seem stunted. Uh, things might slow down like flower fruit production. And if that happens, you may want to use a nice balanced fertilizer that has maybe some calcium, sulfur, magnesium, as well as the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash. So a nice balanced fertilizer used lightly uh, when need be will help. Uh, the nitrogen in it can help with the growth, the green growth. The phosphorus can help with rooting and fruit and flower production. And the potash helps uh, the tree to be generally healthier and fight off diseases. Uh, there are two types. There are uh, slow release, like the organics, and then there's fast release, uh, like the synthetics. Some are applied to the soil. Some can be sprayed right over the tops of the plants. And obviously the uh, liquids that can be sprayed on will go to work a whole lot faster. And of course, read the soil, read the label, read the fertilizer label, and remember what you want to do uh, during the warm months. Uh, probably don't want to go higher than 10 on the nitrogen. And uh, a 1064 would be a uh, fairly common fertilizer. And 6% uh, phosphorus, 4% potassium. Then you have to turn the bag over to see if it has any of that calcium, magnesium, sulfur, iron, zinc, all the little micronutrients that are uh, quite important. So this one right here is called a balanced fertilizer, a 10, 10, 10. This is probably one of the most popular fertilizers there is. A 10, 10, 10 can be used on just about everything. And uh, the numbers uh, indicate once again, the uh, available nitrogen potash and phosphate. And uh, some of the 10, 10, 10s also have uh, the calcium and magnesium and iron and zinc and other things we need. Okay. Now, two months ago, we talked a little bit about uh, composting and uh, how compost can be an effective source of nutrients. It's great for the soil, it holds the soil open, it provides a nice base for the little bacteria and fungus and micronutrients. The compost is best worked into the soil. Uh, so we put the compost in the soil, we put the mulch on top of the soil. And uh, if you're creating your own compost, you're gonna have some of the best soil in the world. Okay. Pruning can be done uh, at this time of year to remove unwanted growth. And as I mentioned, if it was a shading, like let's say your vegetable garden, you don't want shade on your vegetable garden. If there are branches hanging over it, uh, you can cut them right now. Um, but the major pruning is done in the winter. Summertime pruning should only be done on a need to basis. Okay, so. If you have to prune it this time of year, you'll, you'll do it for safety, okay? You do it to remove old, dead, and diseased stuff. And you might do it because uh, some plants, like let's say a crepe myrtle or a wisteria, some flowering plants, it's best to prune them immediately after flowering. This gives them the greatest chance to build up for the next year's uh, flowering season. Uh, some fruit trees ripen better if they get more sunlight down through the center of the plant. So uh, there are some reasons to prune, but if you do have to do it, keep it to a minimum. 
you'll see that the tree on the right there has been pruned, uh, yet it still looks great. Um, it's just had some dead wood taken out. It's had some crossing branches taken out, and it's been thinned out just a little bit. Now, planting during hot weather, it's generally not recommended. Uh, it can be difficult on some plants. For instance, we, we, we love it when you plant natives because they use less water. We know they obviously grow here because they're growing all over the hillsides here. However, some natives don't like water in the summertime. They've learned to survive without summertime water because we don't get any rain in the summer and natives have adapted to that. So the native plants, those should be planted probably in November. There are a few plants though that can be planted uh, during the summer months. And we'll talk about those. Uh, these would be plants that can obviously take the weather. Uh, most of the plants we're going to talk about are going to be sun-loving plants because in the shade, uh, the stresses aren't as great on plants. So first we'll talk about is myoporum, which is often used as a lawn substitute. It's used as a ground cover uh, for large areas, hillsides, etc. It will actually establish in the summertime. It is native to Australia, not here, and it can take summertime watering. So you can plant this and water it deeply, uh, but infrequently, of course, and it, it can establish during the warm months. Junipers, same thing. Junipers uh, love the sun, love the heat. They can be planted now, and they will establish themselves uh, with uh, thorough, deep, infrequent waterings. Lantana, I think everybody's familiar with lantana. This plant just loves the heat. It uh, thrives in the hottest, driest locations. Just plant it, don't water it too often, and don't fertilize it. Uh, some of these plants don't like fertilizer. Uh, plants like lantana, rosemary, lavender, salvias, some of the Australian natives, they really don't want to be fed. Uh, most of the problems I've seen with lantana come from feeding them or watering them too frequently. Uh, so this is a great plant to plant during the summertime. Rosemary is another one. It, that can be a great ground cover on a slope or a steep hillside. It's got a very nice root system that will hold the hillside in place. It has to have full sun, it just loves it. There are some upright varieties if you wanted upright shrubs that had that kind of durability. Uh, so rosemary is another good one, doesn't need fertilizing and is a very drought tolerant. Uh, yuccas, these are native to a hot dry regions of Texas and New Mexico. They can be established now. Deep in frequent waterings, full sun, not a problem for them. The salvias, uh, there are hundreds of varieties of salvias. Uh, most attract the butterflies and bees and birds, uh, great plants. And of course, they all smell wonderful. They all smell wonderful. Um, every yard should have several varieties of uh, salvia in it. A day lilies, another trouble free plant. They just will live without any care. Uh, they'll grow just about anywhere. Uh, give them watering once a week and they'll be happy. Uh, most people never even feed them and they do great. After they get old and, and like this clump right here could be dug up and you could get 10 plants out of that. Then you could recondition the soil, put a few plants in and put some more plants elsewhere in the yard. The purple fountain grass is another one. Uh, it can be dug up, it can be separated, cut apart, and new plants can be started from it. Uh, 
just uh, is trouble free and it really doesn't need to be fertilized or watered very frequently. Dudleyas, this one is actually a native plant. Um, and there's other succulents like this that you would probably be uh, okay with planting during these warm months. You can put them in pots or in the ground and uh, water them deeply but infrequently. And uh, succulents are some of the easiest plants on earth to grow. Yarrow uh, is another one that takes the sun and the heat and can be used as a lawn substitute. It can even be mowed uh, if you'd like. It spreads by underground runners. So uh, you may want to put it in an area where it'll be contained. If you have a very nice flower garden that is well maintained and watered and fertilized, believe it or not, this may not be the plant for you. Now, Ribes, this is a large family and uh, includes currants and gooseberries, et cetera. Uh, the different varieties will grow in different areas. Now, we have some native varieties that grow up in our hills here. Uh, and typically, they're growing underneath maybe an oak tree or on the side of a hill where they're not necessarily getting full sun all day long. So, uh, ribes might be um, one of those plants that uh, doesn't need to be out in the full sun all day long. Okay. So that does it for its for our slides. Uh, and I think what we'll do now is we'll see if there were any questions um, regarding any of the things we've talked about. Uh, it was kind of a quick but uh, large subject matter that we had there. So I'm going to go up here and see. What we said, here's a uh, question. Uh, you wanted to know if the presentation will be sent out. It will be available online. Go to the Water District's website. I believe it's uh, your scvwa.org uh, and look under education and there will be uh, a drop down there for you to look at all of the classes that we've had uh, previously and including this one it takes a little bit for the, this one to get online and then if you want any of the handouts uh, for instance the one handout that Laura talked about at the beginning the 100 best plants for SCV marvelous handout half of it is natives but the other half are some of these plants that we just talked about, the lantana and the rosemary, et cetera. So that one handout is fantastic. And it will uh, show you plants that uh, will grow out here. They're proven to grow out here. And uh, they will grow in uh, sunny areas. And there's a few on there for shady areas. Okay. We've got another question here about squirrels they think my slope is a sanctuary yes um, the eradication might be the best answer there uh, these are ground squirrels and they dig holes and they are actually quite dangerous um, a few years back in sherman oak several homes slid down a hillside and uh the jaw just came out and checked the soil and they said, no, the soil was fine. It had nothing to do with the soil or the construction of the houses. What it had to do with was ground squirrel holes. The rain came, washed down and into the ground squirrel holes and made these holes bigger and caused entire hillsides to go down. Uh, so, uh, Eradication of the ground squirrels is probably the best answer. And uh, it's 
probably best for everything involved. You don't want them getting into your yard. You don't want the fleas. Uh, you don't want the problems with them. And no, you're not being a bad person by uh, getting rid of ground squirrels. Uh, next, now, this has to do with mulch. Uh, is there any concern using mulch throughout a yard in fire prone areas? Uh, no, actually uh, putting mulch down helps to keep a little layer of uh, humidity and moisture right on the soil. So they've done studies on this and uh, mulch uh, is not uh, a problem. Mulch do, does not burn very well. Tall grasses are bad news, but our mulches are usually quite low to the ground. And uh, I think if you uh, explore that, you'll find that they are very safe to use even in fire areas. Okay. And see if there's any other questions. If you do have any questions, you can type them in now and uh, I'll be glad to answer them. And um, John, there's some other questions off to like in the chat option. Um, they're asking what causes brown spots in grass and how do you troubleshoot? Okay, well, I, I've given them two options. One is with the cups, put one, one of your cups in a brown spot and another in a green and two others equal distance in between. So you have to use four clear drinking cups. And what that will tell you is whether that brown spot was caused by watering, either excess or lack of. Those brown spots uh, are very common, but they can be caused by a hundred different things. So we want to rule out water as a cause. And the only way to do that is to put those cups out there and turn the water, turn the sprinklers on for 10 minutes, go out and look in the cups. Uh, it'll make a believer out of you. I know when I turn, I don't have sprinklers anymore, but back when I did and I'd turn them on, it looked like everything's getting watered fine. I would put out the cups and I would find no, in fact, uh, the sprinklers are not covering well. So once you have done that, uh, you'll find out whether it is water that's the problem. Now, in the upcoming months, especially around September, uh, you may get brown spots caused by grubs. Uh, the grubs won't be an issue yet because we're in early summer and the beetles are out or coming out now. When they go back into the ground and lay their larvae, then we get uh, all different kinds of cutworms and grubs that eat the roots. Uh, but that's, uh, like I say, that's in the future. That's not happening at this moment. Okay. The uh, next question here uh, seems to be what kind of herbs can be grown now? And I've just mentioned three, salvias, lavenders, and rosemaries. Uh, those three will grow year round. Other things that are fairly easy to grow at this time of year would be oregano, marjoram, and thyme. And those three plants, oregano, marjoram, and thyme, can be grown in pots, grown in the ground. They can be grown as ground covers. They're actually quite decorative. Um, things you want to avoid right now are probably uh, cilantro and basil uh, because they tend to go to seed too fast um, and they just won't last long enough. Okay. Let's see if there's any more. Uh, Laura, do you see any more uh, questions there? No, you did answer the question about the mulch, right? Yes, ma'am, I did. Okay. Yeah, mulch is perfectly safe to use. And uh, yeah, just don't use straw or hay as a mulch and you'll be just fine. I don't see any more questions, John. So I think, I think, I think we're all set for today. Excellent, very good. Well, thank you folks. And uh, hope to see you next month. Uh, what's next month uh, class, Laura? Um, the top 100 um, top plants for SEV. Oh, great. Then we just talked about that. So that'll be a great class. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, real good. So look forward to seeing you then, folks. In the meantime, have a great day. Bye. And, and stay cool. <laughs> stay cool.